Yeah, so hi, I'm Leo. Um, I'm at a new startup called Graphistry where we kind of try to increase how much data you could uh, um, visualize and interact with in the browser by offloading to GPUs in the data center. And it, this is work I did with uh, um, uh, Ari, who's uh, now at Cloudera, and this is from when we were back at uh, Berkeley. And we're looking at the kind of sociology of programming languages. Um, that's, that's kind of overselling a bit. Like, it's a really big area that just not a lot has been done on. So we actually were just focusing on, let's just zero in on adoption. So a bit of a bait and switch here. Um, and by, a lot of these things kind of generalize, and so I um, kind of want you thinking at a higher level. And what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of, like, is actually kind of a source of pain or um, kind of cognitive dissonance I've had over the last 10 years or so of just hacking on programming languages. And for my own work, um, I'd, I, like, you know, I'd be working on JavaScript, and we'd be looking at how do we make it safer. Could we do static analysis and all these sophisticated things? Now at our startup, we're kind of looking at how do you do GP, GPU programming. Are we, are we good? Or? OK, are we? We're good. OK, great. So yeah, and so nowadays when we're working on, at our startup on GP, GPU programming, um, like we know how to make things faster and how to use languages there. But at the, on the other side, we're, there's kind of this unease about when we're actually starting to think about what are the people on the other side of these things. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, Strange Loop, I kind of always like coming to Strange Loop because there are a lot of builders here. So who here has ever made a language or a framework or just some like cool software that they're proud of? Now, keep your hands up. Um, was it about one of, did it did make one of these things better? OK, so most of the hands are still up, right? Now, did you make trade-offs when you had to start thinking about adoption in people? Like, um, actually, put your hands down if you made those trade-offs. All the hands went down. That was my problem. All of the hands went down. I, like, and, hello? No. Oh, no, except for one. OK, so that's, we have, um, I'm very happy for you. <laughs> I'm very envious, actually. Like, I wish I was there. Um, Yes, and actually, yeah, RacketCon is on Saturday, and so you could, should go to that and to learn more about why that is. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm kind of not the only one. We're not the only ones here. Um, one of kind of inspiring moments for me was this essay by Eric Meyer on uh, Confession of a uh, Used Language Salesman. And I, I'd, I'd recommend reading this essay if you ever build technologies like this. And he said his kind of career took a, a, a U-turn um, when he discovered something called the change function. When, and the change function is about um, the threshold to adopting something. Like, when will somebody change their habit to pick up a new technology? And it's basically, it says that when the perceived need of the adoption, like the benefit, is greater than the pain of doing that adoption, then you'll actually, the user will go out and, and, and pick it up. Um, and so Eric was taking a look at his work with Haskell. So Eric Meyer, um, you know, Visual Basic, Haskell, C Sharp, uh, Link nowadays, stuff like that. So, he was working on Haskell, um, which is all, all these wonderful, um, maybe not all wonderful, but a lot of wonderful things in it. Um, but definitely one of the hard parts of Haskell is for all those benefits, it's a new language, new syntax, new build environment, all this stuff. And so once he saw the change function, read about it, it kind of crystallized uh, something for him. He said, from now on, my goal in life would be to also drive the denominator down to zero. And that's his new approach to language design, entirely driven by thinking about kind of the people. And so and we, could, we could actually see this in his career. He you know, left the Haskell, well, maybe not left the Haskell community, but he joined the Microsoft community. And then he would still be working on these beautiful functional programming concepts. Like, for example, look at Link and Rx in, in C Sharp and now in other languages. And he'd, instead of doing it in a new language, he'd embed it in existing languages, uh, languages and uh, really designing around um, this uh, change function. So. At the beginning of the talk, I said this is about some, uh, not just adoption, but something broader. And, um, and I really, when I say sociology, I really mean groups of people. Um, so to get a feel for that is I typed the word coder into Google's uh, image search. And what we see here is, OK, we have, um, what do we have? We have some sort of nerd. Is, there's a category of nerds, and, which apparently is a guy with a laptop. And then, I don't, I don't know, there's like a ninja with like poking himself with a sword somewhere there. Um, then. You know, coder's a coder. Maybe hackers are cooler. Let's look at what hackers are. Um, now it's uh, ski masks, and apparently you sit in your monitor or something like that. But it's always like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but it's always one person and the bits. It's like man in the machine and just some like cult of personality type thing. 
Well, in reality, if, then if I look at actual um, impressive computing systems, like the early ones like the ENIAC, well, there's like a few guys in suits and then a couple women actually doing all the hardware work. And, you know, uh, like this, this, that's, that, that's reality. And then when I look at today, it's like GitHub. We have, um, I don't know, like how many millions of programmers on GitHub. It's like this very collaborative and social thing. And so when I'm looking at my job as a language designer, I need to not be thinking less, less ninjas and ski masks and more, you know, groups of people in the data center, stuff like that. And so what I've been uh, kind of... And what I want to kind of get across in this talk is basically, I think we can design smarter by exploding social, social foundations. As part of that, we need to get more knowledge. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about what um, Ari and I have been doing, to, both on the kind of empirical side of just understanding how groups of people work with languages, and also actually on the theoretical side where, you know, we don't actually, we, there's a lot of stuff we can lift from other communities that have studied how people work together. And there's a lot of good stuff there that we should be taking advantage of. So one of the broadest areas that um, we, uh, kind of one of the basic fundamental questions is, how does a language grow? Um, one inspiring area from social science here, here um, came up with this theory of the ecolo ecological model of adoption. And we can kind of understand this in terms of how music spreads and how, how does that grow. And so with music, like, I, I love music. Like, there's this Canadian reggae band that kind of apparently I'm the only one out of my friend's group who, who likes, and that's a very big oddity. And for that, like, there, there's something weird going on. It's like, we don't, we don't all have time to listen to weird Canadian reggae bands. And so reality, what happens is music generally spreads through your friends. That think of who your favorite bands are and think of who your friends' favorite bands are, and there's probably some sort of uh, intersection. The further out in your social network you go, probably you know, the, the like, less of an intersection there is. And the ecological model is kind of looking at, is kind of looking at people as sort of a resource that, like, the, the, the music grows through people. Like, you can't have multiple, it's hard to have multiple, like, all the music on one person. So um, it's kind of this battle over people. And so we could look at programming languages, and there's a um, kind of very natural process we can see here. So maybe somebody starts using a language in a niche where, I don't know, I'm, I'm a big JavaScript junkie, for, for better or for worse. Then uh, libraries grow, so there's this whole Node.js thing where they added a, a package manager to, essentially to JavaScript. Um, user base grows, and, and now um, today we have JavaScript uh, is, is basically on the server and it's just getting, today even in hardware, um, for example, uh, my, our, again, our startup, we're looking at using JavaScript for GPUs, for example. And so there, we, we are seeing this kind of virtuous cycle of, of, of this, this spread. And so we decided to look at the data to see if we, um, like maybe we can start fitting some of these adoption models or just seeing, getting some insight. And so I'm going to be talking about a few different data sets here, so I wanted to kind of do it all in one go to, to give you a feel for it. The first one was a data set that we actually got from somebody else. Um, so David McIver had been running this uh, cool website um, called the Hammer Principle. It's, if you ever want to just answer some questions and kill some time, go, go there. And basically, we got about two years of, of survey results from him from about 13,000 different people where they just said what the, compared different programming languages and how they thought about them. And from there, um, actually on my, on my homepage, if you, if you Google my name, hopefully you can get here, we did some cool visualizations where we can see what, different, what correlated, uh, kind of like ranking different languages and seeing different correlations. So for example, the, uh, the, um, the Koch uh, theorem prover is highly correlated with, I often feel like I'm not smart enough to write this language. And so, and it's, <laughs> so I, I actually suggest you kind of play around here. Maybe you'll find some new languages or kind of see different ways of looking your, at your favorite languages. Um, but using that, like we actually, the, the real reason we did, um, we did those visualizations, we're kind of curious, but also we used it as a viral campaign. So we started getting people kind of curious about the project. And um, we had some cool friends, um, especially Jean on the right. She's, you, you could tell she's cool because she has the sunglasses. Um, she, uh, actually, she's on the job market, I guess. So if there are any academics here, it's Jean Yang. Um, so we, we launched this viral campaign, and then we actually got people to answer our own questions. So about how, what they actually did for the real job, for real um, projects. And there we got, uh, I guess, about uh, 15, 1,600 respondents just saying what they actually do. And this was interesting data. At the same time, we were, back then we were at Berkeley, so there's this thing called MOOCs going on, these online courses. First, we were kind of worried about the data sets there. Like, yeah, we were able to get another, I guess, 1,100 people, but we were worried that they would all be students. It wouldn't be interesting data. But in reality, the people who take MOOCs are the people who have a day job and can't go to school, so they'll like, take a look at some videos in night classes. I'm sure actually a bunch of people here do. Like, I definitely now and then will like, look at a math MOOC or something. 
Um, and so that was actually an interesting data set. So that was uh, very, both of those surveys were kind of biased towards working professionals. And then finally, you know, people are subjective. Maybe we could look at the, the real data. So we look at a lot of repositories. A lot of our work, we looked at SourceForge, about 10, over 10 years of, of projects. That was, I think, about a quarter million projects. And then also more recently, um, and I'll sprinkle that in a bit of GitHub and more recent things. So using that, like, let's, let's start digging in. It's kind of a very high level one. Um, again, we want to look at um, how languages grow, and um, in particular through niches. So we took a look at projects in SourceForge. So here we're looking at the Squirrel SQL client. And what we see is that um, it's, you know, we, we know the name, but more importantly, we know it's in the niche of front end. So it's some sort of front end technology, and the programming language is Java. And so we just mapped out for different languages how they're used in different niches. So on the top, we're seeing Java, and we're seeing that it's used a lot. Um, if we look at blogging, it's kind of, out of all the niches, it's kind of lower, like maybe 10% of the, of the blogging projects are in Java. But if we look at a more popular use of Java, there'll be maybe search. Um, and then if we look at the bottom, we're, uh, we're looking at Scheme. So, or I, I'm, uh, maybe Racket, I don't know. Like, I guess this was before the name changed, so probably Scheme. Uh, and so here we see it's kind of used in, only in more particular categories. Like, for example, build tools jumps out from the bottom. Um, and, and also note that the, the y-axis are a little different here. So for Java, it's more popular. So the y-axis, it's we're dealing up to 60%, while Scheme, uh, it's kind of it's still growing. And so it's more at this, uh, you know, 3 4% range. Uh, and so we wanted to see is, the, is, you know, are these fundamentally different languages? Like, how do all the languages, how do we think about how, you know, why is Java so general while Scheme is kind of more in specific categories? Like, um, and so we plotted that out. Uh, and this is something called the dispersion. Um, I don't really want to explain it, but basically think of the Java general, lots of niches on the top left. Um, and so those are very popular and very general. And on the bottom right is less popular um, and, more, and uh, used in more kind of nuanced, specific niches. And we see there's actually this very gradual curve. And so if you think back to that ecological model, like, that actually kind of makes sense that you're sort of, you go from niche to niche to niche. Um, so to me, that was kind of, it was interesting to get that sort of validation of, like, and I don't know, correlation, correlation, causation, whatever, but like, you know, it was interesting data. Um, using a kind of, originally we did, it, uh, we did another analysis, not actually originally with the SourceForge data, but there's a problem with that. Um, so we actually used our survey data here. And what we wanted to understand is more of those niche languages. And so what I'm doing here is on the x-axis, I'm plotting out different languages. Um, so the, and on the y-axis, I'm plotting out um, kind of their popularity or the proportion of projects using them. So for example, on the top left, uh, I think I lost the label, um, is Java. And so almost somewhere 10 to 20% of the projects are all in Java. And there's kind of this winner takes all feel that you can't have like 100 projects all taking 20% of the market share. Like just the numbers don't work. And so if you're counting on having like, you know, hundreds of millions of users, like you're, you're in for a rocky time. What's interesting about this graph is that it's uh, something called a long tail. Um, so I think we're all in the startup era, with, like we're all familiar with that. But what that tells us is basically we have a lot of languages that could live in the long tail. So that if you find your special something, you could find your market share. You could become, build a, um, I don't know, profitable, but at least sustainable language with an actual community that uses it. Um, so to me, that, that was very um, heartening that, like, you know, maybe you won't win the lottery, but at least, like, you'll get users and you build something uh, legitimate. So. That, that was kind of a very macro level trend of like how, how, do, how do languages grow. Um, now I want to kind of zoom in a bit about other programmers at, at a more personal level. Like how does a programmer think? How do they act? Um, um, or how do groups of programmers act within an organization? That type of thing. Um, and sometimes, you know, on a hobby project, maybe I'm a kid in a candy store, but most, most of my coding nowadays is, is cor corporate or like, you know, with groups of people in an open source project. And so there are constraints. So we kind of wanted to understand a bit of that. So we did, uh, looking at our survey, this is kind of interesting. We asked for your last project, um, and about 80% of the people were answering for a work project. So I guess the last project, most coding is indeed for work. Um, we, we saw how, what, what they kind of prioritized for when picking a language. Um, and what's really interesting about this is um, I was expecting, uh, actually, if we jump back, I was expecting things like performance or speed or safety or all that stuff that I put in that first slide and we all raised our hands for. I was expecting that to be the important stuff. Those are all sort of in the middle, um, kind, of the, kind of this 50% kind of, I picked it because it's fast, maybe half, half the time, something like that. 
But when, when I look at the, you know, this um, 60, 70 percent type of stuff, that's open source libraries, number one. I picked it for the batteries being, the batteries being included, and not in general, but pro I don't, I'd love to follow up. Was it because of you know, a particular domain or um, just general libraries? And the other part was more just even stepping back from the software, is just looking at the, the organization and the community. Is it, um, I'm familiar with the language. My teammates are familiar with the language. We have some legacy code. And we actually have some more numbers there. About 30% of the time, it's, uh, it's just because what you used in the last project, things like that. So that, that was interesting. So that when, I'm when we're designing for adoption, this is what we need to keep in mind. So that, that was pretty uh, eye-opening to me. Uh, then kind of digging deeper into like, OK, well, that's how they pick a programmer picks for a project. But how about for a career? Like, how do we, how does a programmer pick, just as how we might choose a foreign language, how do we pick a, uh, a computer language over time? Um, and there's kind of this ugly quote in the, uh, I think it was the New York Times. Um, they're saying, baby boomers and Gen Xers tend to know C Sharp and SQL. Guy Y knows Python, um, Gen Y knows Python and, and Hadoop. And this is a recruiter who is going to impact who gets hired where. Uh, and that's, that's not good. Um, <laughs> like, if that, like, you know, if, if the pointy hair people are thinking this way, that um, maybe if it's true, it's OK. I don't, I don't know. Like, maybe it's still bad then. But, you know, we have data. Let's, let's take a look. So the first thing we did is we just asked, um, you know, for different languages, what are, what's the spread of, of people knowing them? And so um, what's interesting, OK, JavaScript and Ruby, th those are those Gen Y languages, right? Um, that looks like, what is it, mean of 35 years old? And in reality, it's all of these. Like, you have the same, it's, it's a very flat graph. It's a very boring graph, because like, we all know everything. <laughs> uh, so maybe, maybe that was good, OK. Um, so now we have some data to back that up. Um, but uh, me as the kind of, like, you know, again, thinking back to, like, natural language versus computer language, like, you know, invented language, um, what's interesting to ask is, well, how do we go through languages over time? Uh, so at any point in time, we, um, we ask people, how many languages do you know well? And, or we ask them actually to list them out. And then we also ask them to list out which languages they kind of know. And so the ones you know well are, are in green. Um, and so we, did, we bucketed it by different ages. Um, that's the x-axis. And what we'll see is, um, Pretty much, again, it's, it's kind of a boring graph. It's a little more jagged. But like across all the ages, generally, if, uh, you'll kind of know well maybe about four languages. That's your working set um, of what you feel comfortable in. And then you'll say maybe one or two more languages that you kind of sort of remember. Um, and the, it's not like you have those for life. Um, the key, um, key part is, with that previous fact, is that that's just what you keep in memory. And then over time, you will um, kind of page in, page out, learn new things. And so as a designer, I was kind of curious, like, how does learnability, like, what, what um, could we start putting some numbers to that and understand how we, um, maybe not how to design for it, but what should our goal be? Uh, and so we compared for different languages how long people uh, said they, um, it took for them to know it well. And so this is a kind of a very subjective thing. So um, it's, designing these types of things is not easy, like, but that's an entirely other uh, conversation. Um, for this one, I think it was somewhere along the lines of that you felt proficient in it, um, for whatever that means. And what was interesting here is most of them are kind of less than six months, like except for the two on the left, which are C and C++, which basically are not managed languages. And so in those, like it'll take um, you know maybe a year or two years, something like that. Um, so that that was interesting to me as a if we are designing for learning um, and as as part of the adoption process, manage definitely is a big part here. Uh, it, that's at least one thing we could say. And finally, uh, for anybody who's had to kind of onboard a, ju a junior developer or been thinking about, again, like recruiting and this kind of ability to, um, you know, maybe you're a polyglot uh, firm and you have to um, teach people new things, there's a question of what you have to actually teach them. And there what's interesting is to look at uh, categories of languages. Um, and so there what we uh, looked at was the probability of knowing a language given um, you knew, uh, given in school you learned something a bit about a related language. And so for example, um, in general, I think functional programming, like, so we look at these different categories, like functional programming, like low-level assembly languages, more mathematical ones. And the, the, the functional, let's focus on like, the schemes and the MLs of the world. What's interesting is that your CS degree doesn't matter. I'm sorry. <laughs> it might have been expensive, but uh, maybe it matters for other things. Like, you know, I, I care about languages. So for that, it, apparently, um, you, have a, you go from 
CS majors will know a quarter of the time, and then non-CS majors will know them 20% of the time. There's like, you know, this 5% difference, maybe, whatever. Um, well, it's fun, but then if you actually ask, well, did you learn one of those languages in part, as part of your coursework? And so that's a more specific question. And then, wow, we go from 15% to 40%. So now that's, OK, as long as you actually sit somebody down to actually learn a category of language, they'll actually retain that. that, that um, and then I was, I was thinking about this. And there's, uh, so Peter Norvig, uh, head of, I believe, Google Research nowadays, um, he, he had this great uh, essay about learning languages and how to, be, how to learn, a, I think, a, learn a language in, in, I think, nine years or, or 10 years, something like that. And uh, one line there was, learn at least half a dozen uh, languages, one that does, I don't know, class-oriented stuff, one that does functional programming. And that really meshes with what's here, so that when we're talking about onboarding people, that um, this is the hard stuff. Getting somebody going from Python and Ruby, that's easy. This is, um, this is what we need to think about. OK. So uh, stepping back up a level, we have um, a bit of a feel for uh, we have a bit of a feel for how um, programmers kind of the, on the data side. I want to actually now go go back to the, the theory side to so see what we can learn from sociology here. Here I'm, um, I was very inspired by um, a field of research called uh, diffu diffusion of innovation. Um, has anybody actually ever heard of this thing before? Ooh, OK, we have like somebody over there. And OK, if you remember anything at Strange Loop, like ignore all my other stuff. Like this is probably, this will serve your career really, really well, um, just in your ability to build things. And um, so this is really important. So what happened here is basically is uh, maybe the beginning of the data science revolution was maybe 1920s, 1930s. Um, and what happened there was basically, Sorry for anybody who, who thinks it has to do with math or anything like that. Um, what was really happening is, is we started having data, <laughs> and, uh, and data about how people actually do things. Um, and so what was going on is there's somebody who was uh, at the agricultural, uh, some agricultural uh, university in, in the US was looking at how come farmers are not, getting, uh, not buying genetically modified seed corn? Um, part of it is probably that's a terrible name for anything, like <laughs> especially for your like how to shift your livelihood. And but he's like he's questioned like, well, we know this will increase your yields. This will like uh, because you know less like um, insects are going to be eating things. It's it's actually it is actually a natural process because back then they didn't know how to do any low level stuff. It's all just about breeding stuff like that. Um, but they actually went from farm to farm to actually understand, started recording data about how people actually adopt things. And then actually, back then, by then, we were starting to actually having more uh, usable statistical methods, and we were actually able to have both the data and the analysis, so data science. Um, so that, that was kind of an exciting thing. Uh, and from there, you know, genetic corn is one thing, but since then, they've looked at like pretty basic stuff, like how do we convince people to not drink dirty water? Like, that, I don't, if I gave anybody here like, a glass of dirty water, like you you would not be happy, right? So, but that, that was actually, that's a big shift. And actually, even today in parts of the world, that's a big shift. And so when we look at programming languages like static typing or like anything that we believe is good, this is sort of that same problem. And so there's uh, this diffusion of innovation process. Um, ooh, now I'm torn. Nobody here has, only one person here has heard of this, but I was going to skip this slide. <laughs> you know what? Um, this will be good. You should do your homework. I'll post these slides, and you should, you should read these. Um, I will walk through actually an example um, even better. So there's a, there's a process of, that people go through um, each one of these steps. Um, now, I'll, I'll, let's do an example. Um, like, I, I really like step number four. It's like, let's say you've decided to, to adopt something. Like, all right, we're going to use this genetically modified corn on my, on my farm. Now we need to try it. Like, you have this technology, now you need to try it. And so for the uh, seed corn case, they said, well, it's easy to try because you don't have to do your entire farm. We could just do a little corner of your farm and try it out. And then we could do the experiment, and then we could see the results. And we say, OK, well, if we had this result and we multiply it across our entire farm, this is great. And so that's a very tri uh, triable technology. And all of these, it's kind of common sense. But you know, 500, 1,000 studies later, like, this is really what happens. And at the same time, there are catalysts. So for each step, things that make them go faster or slower, things like that. Um, and sometimes they apply to multiple things. And so as, as, it's kind of an interesting example um, that I think is very extra pertinent to programming languages, is we look at something like um, uh, kind of uh, 
uh, a case study in safe sex in the 1980s. So there was kind of this epidemic going around uh, in, in the US and kind of seeing res uh, resurgences around the world. But basically, here's this, it's, again, it's a stupid common sense thing, but it is a technical innovation, is that, you know, how to uh, prevent yourself from disease. And it has a clear relative advantage that you will not die. That's, that's, that's supposed to be, like, you know, decreased risk of death. That's, that's good. Um, it's a simple process, great. On the other hand, um, it's not observable. How do you tell if your friends are using it? Like, you know, how do you know that somebody in the next village is using it? Like, that, that's not an observable thing. How do you try it out and decide that it works for you? Like, you know, I try lots of things and I don't die. Like, the, it's like, you know, maybe I don't try all the things, but like, I try a lot of things and I don't die. And so, like, how do I know that? The, like, it's hard to establish causation for the, uh, when nothing happens. Uh, and finally, there's compatibility with lifestyle that, like, well, you know, now involves two people, a team, whatever. It has to work with everybody. Um, like on the farm, like uh, it, it's important that, uh, for example, if all the, the supply changes change, like that's a big concern. Like in the cloud, we're seeing this the big shift. Um, so there's, there's these notions of compatibility. And so where I, why, why I'm bringing this up, though, is that something I care a lot about is safe, uh, safer software. And I think a lot of people here do. Uh, and this kind of absence of like death, that's, that's, that's kind of like static typing, right? It's like, you know, the, you know you're, you're, the shuttle will not explode, that type of thing. Um, and so I think there's a lot to learn here. And so I, I want to kind of look at how they went about it. And like it, once you think about this way, like it, it, it makes a very new approach to design. Um, so in this case, uh, again, remember 1980s, so I think people were wearing neon and like, I guess, yoga pants even back then. So it's, think kind of like now, but more neon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so these researchers, you know, like uh, white lab coat, clipboard, they, they went to gay bars, and it's it kind of nuts. Uh, and and they, um, they identified opinion leaders, like people who are there pretty often, people who are like, you know, the center of the crowd, like, you know, the, the most neon pants, or like, you know, the headband, like, uh, and <laughs> they, they, taught them about, they taught them about this, te this technical innovation. And it's like, this is, uh, you know, this is gonna save lives, you should know about this, and what's more, we should, we'll teach you how to t tell other people and then what I really liked is they gave them silly hats. Um, they gave them, actually, they gave them pins. They gave them a pin with a traffic light. And now all of a sudden you had all these cool people wearing your neon headband, your yoga pants, and your pin. Like this, everyone has this traffic light pin. And now all of a sudden this is a very observable thing. That was one of the catalysts. You can see that other people are doing it. And you say, hey, I, I like your headband, but what's with the pin? And that, that, that was sort of the, that was like a, a big deal. And now all of a sudden, whoa, let me, uh, let me tell you about safe sex. Great, and I have that opener. And what's great is that they did an A-B test. We didn't call them A-B, or maybe we called them A-B tests back then. Um, and so in about three years, like they compared a few different towns where they're trying this, 15% uh, more good behavior, 15% uh, less bad behavior. So it's like a 30% shift. That's, you know, when we're talking about saving lives, I, I feel pretty good about that. Um, I would love to duplicate that for, for our stuff. Um, I think there's some great examples where we could look at technologies that have succeeded uh, um, in terms of these principles. So for example, uh, trialability, this, um, which we, we had talked about, uh, there's this uh, static analysis company. Maybe they won't do, you won't do your type system, but you'll actually run a, stat, you'll run a static an analyzer, and you'll actually, not only, you know, Scala is free, you'll pay Coverity to, to, do, to do static analysis for you. you know, like, does, does anybody here at a company pay for static analysis? Ooh, shame. Okay. <laughs> so, they, but they, they actually are uh, kind of, I guess, in the bigger corporate world, they're, they've actually made a lot of um, inroads. Um, then on, on the relative advantage side, if we look at something like Hadoop, all of a sudden you could scale your compute, JavaScript, all of a sudden you could program your browser, or compatibility. Um, that, you know, Scala, like, you know, it's a weird language, but it runs on the JVM, so if you're a Java shop, you know, it's weird, but it works. Um, maybe one day you can, you can also get the Hadoop thing, so it's like this like double, double whammy. Um, so I, I think it's useful to, to think about this stuff. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is now that we've kind of, I'm hopefully have gotten you thinking more socially and like thinking about groups, thinking about both the data and the theory side, there might be ways to leverage it. Um, thinking about, again, what we kind of care about in our languages. So the, the first one I'm talking about is productivity. Um, this is something that's already happened uh, um, and I think the case of Stack Overflow is, is just, just phenomenal. 
If we chart over time how many new answers are posted to Stack Overflow, we see that um, it, we kind of did this like, you know, several orders of, of magnitude over about four years. So this is great. You know, there's a line that's like, you know, up and to the right. That's, that's wonderful. What's really cool is when you do the cumulative distribution of, of, of this. And so if we look at, let me actually jump, run over here. So <laughs> if we look at the 50% line, it kind of intersects with 2012, which means by, by 2013, half of the content on Stack Overflow was just made in one year because they had designed for these network effects. And so if you're going to, um, and actually somewhere between 2000 and 2012, there's a big shift in how people um, programmed, where basically instead of going straight to documentation, you would go straight to Google. And then instead of Google returning you the documentation, Google would return you the Stack Overflow answer. Like this is how most of us program today. Um, and actually now I know new language designers who, screw it, we're not going to have our own forum. We're just going to do it all in Stack Overflow. So this is, this is the right kind of thinking. Uh, I think this could change other things we want to do. So for example, um, I, you know, we do more uh, data analysis where, where I work now. And there I'm often trying to fit curves. Actually for, the, for this work I have to fit a bunch of curves. And I kind of feel dumb sometimes in that I'm doing, re, is kind of retrotting common work. And so for example, I'm like, okay, well, I need some sort of um, fitness function. Um, so I need to install it somehow. So this is in case I was using R. Um, I need to install it somehow, and then I need to import it. I need to kind of find those right invocations. I don't even know if those are the right libraries. And then I am kind of feel like as soon as I'm saying this, that I should sort of be suggested, pointed towards other options in case these don't work out. But OK. Uh, then once I start processing these, um, OK, let me try to fit my data to some sort of distribution, like the exponential distribution. Well, what if uh, it's not the exponential distribution? I should fit something else. What do people normally do after this step? Like, if maybe it's uh, a power law, like as we saw. Like, wh how, do, how do people, what's the next likely thing? Um, finally, I needed to do some post processing. Like, I, I love data visualization. I want to see the answer. Maybe I had a bug, so I, I want to see my data. And I want to get a summary so that I could like, report some impressive numbers. There's probably, for each one of these steps, there are these very common things that if I talk to our specialist, they'll say, oh, well, if it's not the fitness package, it's like, I don't know, like some Bayesian sampling package or something. And what I would love to see is basically, for example, just take all of the REPL logs from all the people and do kind of a code hinting. So there's a wonderful talk yesterday by Joel um, on, on code hints. That he, he would do it randomly, but I would love to just see what are the things that people do. And so now we want to use our collective knowledge to improve the programming experience. Um, and this is actually a pretty sparse space. Like, they're like, this is a very natural and repeated workflow. At the same time, OK, let's say we want to improve how we do safety in our languages. So there's a lot of fuzzing that goes around today. Like, that, you know, we love unit tests. And better than unit tests is programs that write unit tests for us. And so that's, that's the fuzzing world. And, but the problem with the fuzzing world is that it kind of often gets bogged down and it can't actually get good coverage. But in reality, we actually, you know, if, you have a, if you're a web shop and you have millions of users, um, or even tens of millions or hundreds of millions of users, chances are most of those lines of code um, have been traversed by somebody. And so w w shouldn't we have traces of those and just generate our unit tests from all those kind of unique ways of traversing the code? So for example here, um, let's say we have some you know, control flow graph of a program that you, know, you start at the top, we, we run some different statements, somewhere in the middle we branch because there's the if statement, um, maybe we could use a smart, like, you know, an SMT solver or any of these, like, smart SAT solver things to kind of figure out how to generate an input that makes us go one way. But for the ways that maybe we can't figure out that, you know, the magic number was 312, maybe some user actually hit that in because that is an interesting use case for a lot of users. We should have that recorded and we'd like to have kind of augment our um, kind of our, our static tests with some dynamic knowledge of what people actually do. We already do this for analytics and to improve how we build our software or build our product. Why don't we do this for improving how we build our software? Like that, it's, just, it's kind of weird to see the marketing world being ahead of the programming world. Normally, it's the other way around. Um, so jumping back up a level, um, what I've kind of talked about today is some scientific tools for grasping this normally fuzzy concept of sociology and social interaction, and definitely a big focus on adoption, because that's just where we started. And particularly, if we were looking at empiricism and theory. Um, you could look at our results, other results. A lot of this is, you know, just run a survey, and you can actually get a lot of knowledge really quickly. And then hopefully, I've changed uh, how you think a little bit about how we actually design these systems. That 
you know, maybe we still care about productivity, performance, and safety, but at the same time, you know, we're not lone hackers in the basement. The kind of the more people there are, generally, the better systems um, get, and so we should design for those. Uh, for that, I'm going to kind of do a, one last uh, kind of quick plug here. Uh, tonight, I'll be doing a, a kind of a birds of a feather on session thing, where we'll actually talk about all the. Here, this is all the soft stuff that's kind of cool. I'll be talking about all the crazy stuff, where, what's happening with data visualization and with like hardware acceleration, with stuff like render farms and and connecting those to browsers and machine learning, all that good stuff. Cool. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, nope. Matthias. Uh, hi. hi. Is it a real lens that you can see people rolling around, ne never program along? From the very beginning, from the time that you had to keep going in high school, the time that you had to keep going as a 15 year old or a I think. Uh, so one of the questions is, it was one of the lessons or, or the lesson that um, we should, we should teach, teach people together, not as individuals. Um, I think that's, I don't know if our data says that, um, but I would definitely believe that. Uh, like, I know some wonderful autodidacts, um, but they're definitely the minority. Um, and that, yes, uh, I, would, I would agree with you. Uh, any others? Oh, yeah, there's a hand back there. Sorry, it's a little, the lights are all in the fa my face here, so I'm a little slow on this. So. This isn't really a question, but have, have you come across a, a, a lecture called Growing a Language by Guy Steele? Yeah, so there's this wonderful talk. Um, uh, it's a recommended uh, Growing a Language by Guy Steele, um, and it's and actually, um, uh, which is about basically how do you start from basic primitives and slowly and have a very simple language, and, you, and from there just kind of build up more and more abstractions. Um, and I would actually, again, point, point back to the Racket community, where I have this concept of language as a library, where when I think about things like compatibility and simplicity and a lot of those diffusion of innovation concepts, it just blows away all, a lot of the complexity needed for adoption. I and mean, then I'd say growing a language or this paper by Sam tobin Hodgstad and others called Languages as Libraries so is just wonderful here. And uh, one more there. Ooh, one of the, what are the most uh, useful diffusion catalysts? Um, ooh. I think there are a few. Um, trialability, um, like the, the, how, how fast you get to, to hello world is, is this huge, huge thing. Uh, like, I've, you know, for example, for me, like a lot of, for many, a long time, like Haskell was just, out of, was it, is for, the numeric tower is what prevented me from writing code in Haskell, right? It was a very stupid thing. Um, the, the other catalyst, um, I, I think actually, again, if I look at the startup space, just being able to just go is, is huge. Um, trialability, so that's kind of the, another one is um, observability, I think. When I look at successes like, you know, going from CGI to PHP, um, that, or like if I look at the, the success of Scala, a lot of it was observability that, um, you know, Scala is this unknown thing until Twitter sort of did it. And it's unclear if Scala actually how important it really was to Twitter's success as an engineering firm. Like, maybe it, it, it attracted great engineers. I don't know. Um, but people all of a sudden had a stamp of approval. So, and that was a big deal. And, and when I look at other languages, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Go. Well, Google uses Go, and it's made by these heroic programmers. Um, great. So again, oh, yeah, sorry. So um, I believe the question was, is, is a little faint, um, like my hearing's not so good. Um, I used to work at a radio station, so it's <laughs> not, uh, standing in for speakers is not a good idea for prolonged periods of time. Uh, I think the question was, a lot of languages are kind of 
could have different users. And so how do we, how do we deal with that scenario in general? Um, and I think that when I was talking about niches, there's sort of the, especially when starting out, finding a place where making a few people fanatical is, is kind of the, like, you don't want to, like, appealing to everybody is hard because everybody's, like, on average, everybody's different. <laughs> and so, but finding enough people who are similar and who will be fanatical and then growing from niche to niche, um, it's kind of a general answer, but I'd love to talk more about that. And front row. Yes, yes. So the question was, um, so in the, in the safe sex study, detecting um, community leaders was a big deal. Um, and that, that, that's how they kind of did this viral campaign effectively. Um, and there's also, there's a notion of higher, people listen to, high, to you, you don't, you listen to your friends and you listen to kind of like celebrities or, or you have influencers. So the question is, are there the same things that we're seeing in the kind of pro programming language world? And I, I don't know, like, I feel like cult of personality is really strong here. And so there, I think there's on the individual level, but also then going back to that Twitter example, that maybe it's not an individual, but I think for us, it's, you have these kind of high prestige organizations. And so that once they give their stamp of approval, or you have a, and, and it's kind of stupid, like at Google, like you have the Rob Pikes and whatever, who are actually a very tiny part of this bigger organization. Just getting a few people, like maybe, oh, somebody in the Google Maps team, just like one individual, just getting them to be fanatical, uh, that, that all of a sudden, just because one team is using it, Google is using it, right? Uh, and probably should clear out after this, so uh, one more. Yeah. Ooh, that was a great question. Um, so were there differences between the subjective and the objective, like um, the reported and the, and the actual? Uh, there were a lot, but they're not coming to mind. <laughs> so, all right, great. All right, well, uh, thank you. So hopefully you learned something here.